Best-selling author and inspirational speaker Roger Crawford has helped more than 3,000 audiences turn the pessimism of I can't into the power of I can. Sports Illustrated calls Roger one of the most accomplished, physically challenged athletes in history. His remarkable life story was the subject of an Emmy award-winning television movie. You may have seen him on Larry King Live, CNBC, Good Morning America, and in publications such as USA Today, Tennis Magazine, and Fast Company. Roger Crawford is a champion on center court and on center stage. Thank you very much. You're very kind. Thank you. You heard that I played tennis, and I know a lot of you are thinking, okay. I see your hands and your legs. How well do you play tennis? Well, during my career, I played John McEnroe, and don't be too impressed, because I want to tell you what I learned playing John McEnroe. Positive attitude does not work every time. <laughs> That's what I learned. I slipped my finger in between the space that you see. When I first started playing, I used a Wilson T2000. Some people call this a coincidence. I think it was Providence. Walked into a tennis store, my finger slipped into the throat of the racket and it got stuck. And that's how I began to play tennis, because I could control the racket with one hand. Even though I wore an artificial leg, I have fairly good mobility. In fact, I remember playing this gentleman one time and throughout the entire match I wore long warm-up pants. My opponent didn't realize until the match was over that I wore an artificial leg. He took the loss a lot harder then. <laughs> Playing tennis helped me understand the difference between fear and anxiety. Often we think the words are synonymous, but not by definition. Fear is tied to circumstance. Fight or flight response is a good example of how fear actually keeps us out of harm's way. If we're going to change what's possible, achieve the impossible, in a changing environment, we're going to face a bit of fear. Fear is tied to something real. But anxiety, I believe, is what holds us back. Definition of anxiety is the anticipation of a negative event, whether it occurs or not. Fear tied to circumstance, anxiety to imagination. I was driving from Canada into the United States, and I was stopped at the border by a guard. And I'll never forget what he said. Sir, where are you coming from? I said, Vancouver, Canada. He said, how long have you been there? I said, only a couple of days. His third and final question to me was, where are you going? I said, Seattle, Washington. Where are you coming from? Now, we cannot live in the past, but wouldn't you agree we can learn from the past? Wisdom is defined as evaluated experience. Everybody has a mental file cabinet. Have you ever met somebody who defeats themselves because of their past? Because they pull out the file of disappointment, weakness, failure, and they dwell on that evidence to support their mental attitude. But there are others that change what's possible, that achieve the impossible because they look in their past and they pull out the file of courage and inspiration. And they use that as a template for future achievement. How long have you been there? Have you ever heard somebody make this statement? Well, I'm going to be a lot more positive when things get back to normal. <laughs> have you ever heard that? And here's what's interesting. Ask yourself the first question. Where am I coming from? And I'll bet you'll see one constant. Change. It's inevitable. So therefore, it doesn't seem as if we're going back to normal, but achieving the impossible means that normal is going to lie ahead of us and not behind. That's why I think it's so important to ask the second question. How long have you been there? Third and final question, where are you going? I bet you've seen this in your life. You'll find motivation today if you see possibility tomorrow. As we look into the future, if we can add this next ingredient, the ingredient is lanyap. Lanyap. It's a French Cajun word. Let me tell you how I became aware of it when I was shopping in southern Louisiana. I was looking at the men's suits 
42 regular, 42 long, 42 short. They didn't have my size. I wore a 42 strange. <laughs> it wasn't on the rack. So this gentleman approaches me. Sir, notice you were looking at the suits, hoping I might assist you in some way in finding just the right suit for you. Wow, was I impressed. I said, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your help, but I'm not buying a suit today. I'm just looking. He said, sir, may I ask why? And I said, well, since you ask, I, I just want to be up front. It's because of the alterations. You probably notice when you approach me, my arms are shorter than normal. So it's going to require such extensive alteration. I just don't believe that I'll be buying a suit, but I thank you so much for your help. He turns to me. Sir, I'm sure you're aware that most athletic men have that problem. <laughs> right? I really like this guy. I did. I mean, I wanted to continue our conversation. I said, could you repeat that one more time? Sure, heard you clearly. He said, well, when you have an athletic build like you obviously do, it's going to require alteration for that suit to fit properly. I looked at him. I said, you're absolutely right. I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> but I tell you what, I'll take my athletic body right over to that mirror. So here I am, standing in front of a three-way mirror. He brings over a jacket. I tried on. The arms are a little long. But I remember thinking, that's no big deal. Those could be altered. So I vacillated back and forth. Should I purchase suit or shouldn't I? I decided that I didn't want to make a firm commitment myself. I wanted to check with him. Do you know why? It's not every day you work with an expert in athletic men clothing. <laughs> I wasn't going to pass up this opportunity. So I said, is this a type of suit that an athletic guy like me should be wearing? He said, oh, yes, sir. In fact, there's several others here in the rack that you must have as well. <laughs> I bought them all. And I felt so good about it. Dealer's Department Store, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, has a sign. Sign says, never neglect the lanyap. So I see this word, I said, what does that mean? He said, that's lanyap, it's French Cajun. I said, I've heard that word before. And he gave me this example. He said, here's lanyap. You walk into a place of business, you ask for a dozen oranges. Merchant takes a sack and then begins to count the oranges. One, two, eight, nine, eleven. 12, and then the merchant smiles and takes a 13th orange, and here she says, here's the lanyap, and tosses it in the bag. And the definition of lanyap is beyond full measure. It means a little extra. I, I, I played football. I was a defensive end. And I was so excited. I got into position. The quarterback went back to pass. The play started to develop. I'll never forget it. Quarterback on the other team, as he was scrambling, a young man on my team caught up to him and threw him to the ground. And as luck would have it, the ball bounces into the air. It was like slow motion as it went end over end into my arms. I turn and I run. I saw possibility. The end zone was in sight. I had practiced this so many times in my backyard, and now it was coming true. I was heading for the end zone. As I'm sure all of us would agree, we've seen this in our lives. If we say to ourselves, we're going to achieve the impossible, we're going to face unexpected obstacles, unexpected change. Ten-yard line, young man on the other team catches up with me. He made one last attempt to tackle me. I guess you would call this a shoestring tackle. He grabbed a hold of my left leg. <laughs> That's when I learned about flexibility. It came right off. But I'm still standing. So I hop into the end zone. You could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> St 
stunned silence. The opposing coach walks over the ref. Hey, ref, what's the ruling on that? I was like, I got no idea. Never had a player come apart in my life. I guess we'll call it a tearaway jersey. I'm calling it a touchdown. So this couple told me that they held their son for the first time, and they noticed one of his legs was underdeveloped. His other leg was bent in an awkward position, and when the baby lay down, his leg actually folded underneath him. They turned to the doctor and said, what does the future hold for our son? And I said, I'm sorry, but your son will never be able to walk. In other words, he was saying, he has limited possibilities. But this couple didn't see it that way. That little baby that I'm talking about was me. I wanted to bring this torch with me. It's the one I carried before the Olympic Games. Because there's three words engraved on this rim. And think about it with me for a moment. When you change what's possible, these three words are the result. Altius, Sidious, Fortius. You go higher, faster, and stronger. So where are you coming from? How long have you been there? And where are you going? I look at this torch, I'm reminded challenges in life are inevitable. Defeat is optional. Thank you for having me this morning. Thank you so much. Oh. Roger Crawford, everybody.